The Noble's Knob Goldmine is perhaps the funniest named gold mine in Australia, but it hasn't been without its issues. This historic mine has been given a second life as of 2025, but when it operated during the 20th century, there were some dark chapters in its history. With that being said, it was once the richest gold mine for its size in the world, and it's also one of the strangest. The ore here is famous for producing 100 to 300 ounces of gold per ton of crushed ore, an absurdly rich figure, almost geological folklore at this point. At the current gold price as of right in this, 100 ounces per ton of ore would pay you 621,600 Australian dollars, whilst 300 ounces would net you 1,864,800 Australian dollars. Truly remarkable figures. But Noble's Knob is a very different mine to what we're used to. It isn't chasing quartz reefs laden with gold. Rather, the gold lies within the ironstone. This produces one of the most fascinating geological systems in the country, a deposit that rewrote the rules of where gold could hide. Noble's Knob lies just southeast of Tennant Creek, right in the heart of the Tennant Creek inlier of the Northern Territory. It's part of a cluster of Proterozoic gold copper bismuth deposits, hosted not in quartz veins, but in ironstone bodies that replaced the Warramunga group. A package of ancient greywacky, shale, and minor volcanic sediments deposited roughly 1.86 billion years ago. For anyone used to Victorian or Western Australian goldfields where gold means milky quartz veins cutting through metamorphic rock, Tennant Creek is a revelation. Here, the reefs are massive lenses of hematite and magnetite, dense and dark, often rust red at the surface. To the untrained eye, they look like iron ore, but they hide ounces of gold per ton in tiny pods along their edges. Geologists studying the Warramunga rocks found that the whole area was once squeezed hard from the east and west, like pushing on both sides of a thick rug until it buckled. The rocks crumpled into a series of upright folds, and as they bent, a fine flat texture formed through them, a bit like the grain in wood or the layers in puff pastry. At the same time, parts of the crust were shoved up and over each other along deep cracks called thrust faults, stacking the rocks like overlapping tiles on a roof. Later on, smaller sideways movements, strike slip faults, twisted and kinked the folds even more, leaving the region with a complex crumpled structure that became the perfect plumbing system for gold-bearing fluids. But why does this matter? It matters because these structural features became the plumbing of the system. The cleavage planes and fold hinges created vertical and horizontal conduits for hydrothermal fluids, hot, salty waters that circulated through the crust. Think of them as cracks and layers through which fluids could percolate, carrying iron, silica, and later metals like gold, copper, and bismuth. When those fluids encountered oxidized shale horizons, beds already rich in iron oxides, chemical reactions took off. The fluids dumped their load of magnetite and hematite, forming what geologists call ironstone loads, dense replacement bodies aligned with cleavage and faults. Importantly, these aren't veins filling open space, they're replacement zones, where the fluids dissolved existing minerals and replaced them with iron oxides. That's why the ironstones often mimic bedding and fold geometry rather than cross-cutting it. So the first chapter in Noble's Knob's story was the creation of the ironstones themselves. The movement of hot conate brines, basically ancient seawater trapped in sediments, migrated into the developing fold accesses during deformation. Temperatures likely reached 350 to 400 degrees Celsius, with brines packed with calcium, sodium and chloride salts, roughly 12 to 20% by weight, making them as saline as the Dead Sea or worse. When these brines moved through the sediment pile, they were in chemical equilibrium with magnetite in the rocks. But when they hit more oxidized horizons, like the hematitic shales mentioned before, that equilibrium broke. The fluids dropped their iron as hematite or its hydrated precursors, which later converted back to magnetite as the chemistry balanced out. The result was a network of magnetite, hematite, quartz chloride bodies, elongated along fold axes and cleavage planes the lines of load that would become Tennant Creek's mining corridor. These ironstones can run for tens of kilometres in strike length, but only a few metres thick, like long thin veins of black and red iron. For millions of years, those ironstones sat quietly. Then a new wave of fluids arrived. These fluids were sulphur-bearing gold, bismuth and copper-rich fluids, hotter, more reactive and chemically distinct from the earlier brines. These fluids were probably metamorphic or magmatic in origin, rising from deep crustal sources during later deformation phases. As they infiltrated the ironstones, they began to react with the iron oxides themselves. Here's where the real magic happened. The ironstones acted as giant redox buffers. Think of them as chemical batteries. 
With the reducing, oxygen poor gold bearing fluid meant the oxidized, oxygen rich hematite and magnetite electrons were exchanged. This reaction changed the pH and oxidation state of the fluid, forcing dissolved gold, bismuth and copper to precipitate out of solution. This process is called a redox reaction, short for reduction oxidation. In simpler terms it's a chemical handshake, the fluid gives up electrons to the ironstone and in doing so loses its ability to hold onto dissolved metals. The metals then fall out, crystallizing as tiny flecks of gold, bismuthonite and chalcopyrite within the margins of the ironstone. Not all parts of the ironstone were equal, the distribution of metals was highly zoned. Gold tended to accumulate along the foot wall or bottom of the ironstone or its margins, particularly where the ironstone met rocks rich in chlorite and muscovite, both sheet silicates formed during alteration. Copper and bismuth occupied surrounding zones, overlapping each other in halos. The centre of the ironstone often remained mostly magnetite or hematite with little gold. These zones reflected subtle variations in fluid chemistry, especially pH, sulphur content and redox potential. That's why the richest parts of Noble's knob were not evenly distributed, but occurred in pods or shoots a few metres thick, grading abruptly into barren rock. This explains the almost absurd grade range. Some pods yielded 100 ounces per tonne, while others just centimetres away were almost worthless. And now some history. The deposit was discovered in the early 1930s by Jack Noble and Bill Weber, a pair of partially blind prospectors. Noble's Knob became legendary not just for its name, but for its grades. Some early crushings assayed at hundreds of ounces per tonne, though the overall mine average across decades was closer to 17 grams per tonne of gold, still incredibly rich. Mining started small, with hand sorted ore and a battery in the 1940s. By the 1950s the underground workings were extensive, chasing narrow but high grade shoots of hematite gold ore. The workforce battled everything from heat to rock instability, and the mine wasn't without tragedies, fatal accidents, strikes and finally the infamous 1967 crown pillar collapse. That collapse swallowed the main shaft, the mill and several buildings in one go, leaving a 50 meter wide crater. Miraculously nobody died, but the event forced the operation to convert from underground to open cut mining, and the cave material, the crown pillar stockpile, was later reprocessed for gold. By the time the mine closed in 1985, it had produced over 1 million ounces of gold from just a few hundred thousand tons of ore, a truly extraordinary ratio. For nearly 40 years the mine sat quiet, but in May of 2025 under Pan-African Resources Tenant Mines, the Nobles Knob project poured gold again. The first phase targets the crown pillar stockpile, which still contains over a million tons of oxidized ore at residual grades. Processing stockpiles first makes sense, it's low risk, requires no new blasting, and modern gravity plus CIL circuits can squeeze out metal that 1960s technology left behind. Once the plant is running smoothly, new drilling will probe deeper ironstone roots and nearby structures mapped by magnetic surveys. The company's plan is to ramp up to around 50 to 60,000 ounces per year initially, scaling towards 100,000 ounces per year as new pits and underground extensions come online. If exploration pans out, Noble's Knob could see another decade or two of life. So here's what makes Tennant Creek deposits and Noble's Knob so unique. For the layman, the easiest way to visualize the system is this, the sponge. The ironstones, massive bodies of magnetite and hematite, acted like chemical sponges ready to react. The fluids, deep hot metal bearing waters move through faults and cleavage planes. The handshake, when a reducing fluid met the oxidized sponge, chemical reactions force gold out of solution. The traps, gold collected in pods where the chemistry was just right, often at the foot walls or margins of the ironstone. No open space quartz veins, no flashy milky reefs, just dense, dark, iron rich rocks silently soaking up gold from the crust. This style of mineralization sits somewhere between traditional orogenic gold systems and IOCG or iron oxide copper gold systems like Olympic Dam. But unlike those copper giants, Tennant Creek's hematite dominant loads went all in on gold. And thus Noble's Knob's new life in 2025 isn't just a nostalgia project, it's a proof of concept that the old ironstone goldfields of the Northern Territory can still yield new wealth with modern science. By integrating 3D magnetic modeling, fluid inclusion studies, and hyperspectral mapping, geologists can now see what the 1930s prospectors couldn't. The geometry of the ironstone lines of load stretching kilometers beneath the surface. And while its name might still draw a chuckle, Noble's Knob stands as one of the most chemically elegant ore systems in the world. A billion year old experiment in fluid mixing, 
redox chemistry and structural plumbing that somehow conspired to pack gold into hematite at grades that seem almost impossible. I hope you found this as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.